It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome back to another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders. Alan, how are we feeling? I'm good, man. How are you feeling? I'm good. And uh, actually, you know what? I, I don't know. If, I always throw it to you and ask how you feel. It's nice to be asked how I feel because I'm always the one doing the intro. You rarely throw it back to me. That was a nice change of pace. I appreciate you asking. I'm doing good. I also want to lead off this episode giving a big thanks to all the veterans out there that are either still active or have served. Appreciate you guys. We wouldn't be able to do literally what we are doing without you. So big thanks from the Steelers afternoon drive crew from the Steelers now crew and everybody here. Uh, but yeah, I'm good. Hope everybody out there is good as well. Uh, first, before we get into anything, we're going to remind you at the end too, but just while we're here at the beginning, like subscribe, hit that notification bell. The push to 15 K continues. Alan, a lot to dig into, into this episode. First thing I want to do, yeah, maybe a little bit more clarity. We had a lot of people in the post game asking us about Alex Highsmith last night. Maybe a little bit more clarity in terms of what the time frame could look like. You said you were pretty confident that wasn't a season ender. You know, it wasn't like all doom and gloom in terms of that. He seemed to be relatively chippy uh, for a guy that suffered an injury. Um, so what what could we say about that that we've learned? You know what's funny is, so, you know, I watched the game go to the locker room and then I talk to you like that's the, the and everything yeah. happens very quickly. And in fact, to yeah. peel back the curtain a little bit, yeah, I, first time I've ever been at the commander stadium. So I don't really know where I'm going and to get downstairs and there's a security guard that is like not letting us walk through this hallway that we have to walk through to get to the Steelers locker room. And I was getting um a little, a little upset. And I was like, I came here to do one thing and you're about to keep me from doing it. Like get out of my way. I walked into the locker room, like just as it opened. Um, so it's, I'm not like watching TV, the TV very often. In fact, they didn't even have any TVs for us to watch. All I had was the live view and I see what comes through my social media feed, but like I follow a lot of people during a game. The social media feed is like through the fire hose, you know, like yeah. I miss a lot of stuff. I had not actually seen the back angle replay of the injury oh. when I was in the locker room and I could not figure out why I was getting like so many questions like, Oh my God, it's Alex Highsmith. Okay. And I was like, I don't know. He twisted his ankle. He's going to be all right. And then I saw the backward re and I was like, uh, Oh, Oh, I understand why people think that like someone's yeah. in there with a bone saw, like a civil war doctor. Uh, Cause it looked horrible. Uh, but he's, he's okay. Um, gonna be a couple weeks, not this week, not next week, maybe Cincinnati. I think probably more like Cleveland, but uh, not anything that is gonna cause him to, I even think, need to go on injured reserve list at this time. So that's considering the way that looks, yeah, right. I think everyone will take that, that news. Yeah, absolutely. Especially because, you know, I, on the other side, I obviously want the full complement of players, but should get Nick Herbig back as well as he just yeah. made the addition yeah, of Preston Smith. will be back this week unless, you know, again, hamstring, the eternal caveat mm -hmm. of at any point in the recovery of a hamstring, it can stop being a recovery and start being a re-injury very fast. Yeah. The plan is for Nick Herbig to play this week. Yeah, but how, I mean, they already looked – like geniuses for moving a seventh round pick when they had three for Preston Smith, but like immediately paying dividends. The fact that they did that. It's like uh, to, to extend our, uh, extend our grocery store metaphor, right? Like you, you got your, you got your, 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 your favorite snack. Right. And then they're sitting there on the counter and, and you invite a girl over and she's like, Oh my God, <laughs> I love these. They're my favorite. And then you, yes. Right. That's yeah, I'm, I'm honestly now at this point, I'm curious to see what the next step is here to just keep this thing going. You know, um, how do we continue on with this? Somebody's having an outside linebacker themed wedding. That's that's that's, <laughs> that's, where, that's where we're getting to eventually. Absolutely. Um, so not too much else to say on that. I guess we'll just kind of like wait and see what that looks like. Oh, uh, hopefully, I obviously, Nick Herbig back in week. to it here uh, in the live stream last night about the depth at linebacker and potential mm. options. Say again? The question from last night's live stream we, we had flagged, uh, was it Bernie? Oh, oh. 
Yeah, well, Bernie was all over the live stream, watching it back, I should say, because they were in, not in the live comments, but afterwards they were in the comments, and Bernie McClusty left like seven comments, which we appreciate, Bernie. Um, one of those being about Peyton Wilson. Is Wilson big enough to play a bit outside? Obviously going to need a backup for Smith uh, as we wait for Herbig and Highsmith to get back into the mix. Obviously, we're saying we feel like Herbig is going to be back in the mix. Peyton Wilson, interesting player. We talked about how interesting like the body type was obviously coming out in college. We both loved him. Obviously played on the edge for a little bit at NC State. But like, you know, does he have an NFL body that could be able to do that? Has he really practiced doing that? I feel like the situation would have to get pretty dire for them to use him out there. Yeah, it would not be Peyton Wilson if someone was moving to outside linebacker to fill in. It would be like Isaiah Loudermilk. Um, well, you know, what the Steelers do out of their edges 99% of the time is a lot closer to a defensive lineman than it is an inside linebacker. So, no. Um, could he do it in base defense? Maybe. Um, but not in the nickel when they're in a four-man front, and that's – Upwards of 80, 70 to eighty percent of the snaps. This week was almost all of them. This week, um, there's, uh, and so he could not do that hand down defensive end job that uh, the TJ does so well, that Alex does so well, and so uh, yeah, not not what they would go for for the most part there. Let me ask, is it because of, you know, the body type that he has, or is it because, like, he's a rookie and they don't want to put that much on his plate when he's not even, like, you know, knowing his full role inside yet? Yeah, he's just not big enough. I mean, I, I don't, he's okay. not a very, he's tall, and so he has, like, mm -hmm. some mass, but he's a, he's a skinny guy. Um, I mean, yeah. it, there are some guys who have had, over the years, the ability to do it. Chad Brown did it. Lawrence Timmons did it. Uh, it takes a really special guy. Um, not to say that Peyton Wilson isn't very good, but he is not on that level of athlete. Sure. Absolutely. Um, kind of flipping the script a bit here. We're going to get into actually a few questions, but the one thing that we wanted to bring up uh, first and foremost, because it's going to lead into one of our questions, was the way that Tomlin kind of talked about Lamar Jackson. That's obviously the next matchup that's on the play here is the Baltimore Ravens. And, you know, facing a guy like Jaden Daniels, you, you get a pretty close, I would say, test in terms of what is presented to you, the challenges that both those quarterbacks present to you, just in like, you know, the style. Um, but Tomlin, who speaks high, you know, from time to time about players, obviously, you always see coach speak like that. It was interesting, though, the way that he referred to Lamar as Mr. Jackson. So you can't compare anybody to him. That's Mr. Jackson. What did you make of that? And has he always been so, I guess, I mean, I, I guess I just haven't noticed in the past just how highly he would speak about Lamar. Yeah, I think that was to another level. And it's certainly deserved. I think Lamar is one of the best players in the NFL. Are, should we call him Mr. Jackson? Are we allowed to call him Lamar? I will check in with Mike tomorrow to see if we are allowed to call him Lamar, if we have to call him Mr. Jackson. Steel, um, Steelers, and the, Steelers and their fans might be the only ones that are allowed to just call him Lamar as opposed to Mr. Jackson. If somebody's really He is say. Lamar against the Steelers and not Mr. Jackson, right? Yeah, right. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's it's uh, it's <laughs> definitely it's very easy for Mike Tomlin to be effusive in praise of a player who the whole rest of the mm -hmm. league can't figure out how to stop and he just dominates. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's interesting. But yeah, uh, I don't. So again, I you know I'm not in uh, Tomlin's. I wasn't in Tomlin's press conference yesterday. I wanted to get in the locker room, and uh, Chris Ward was there with me, so he took care of the podium duties, and I went into the locker room. And uh, so I hadn't heard those comments before we talked last night, but I just thought it was very funny that Mike was so complimentary of a guy who he kills. Like, and the only team that kills him really is the Steelers. Like everybody else struggles with this guy. Pittsburgh has him figured out. And I think it's very, like, th this, it's an app comparison. Like, it's, I understand that it's kind of crazy to compare someone to Lamar Jackson, but I'm, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of Lamar Jackson, Jaden Daniels, and maybe more importantly, I think the way the Steelers defended Jaden Daniels is basically their exact blueprint for how they defend Lamar Jackson. I like it, it's kind of, I still can't figure it out. Maybe you have an answer. Why has it worked? Like, what is it about the Steelers game plan for him? You think that has been so difficult for him to figure out for him to crack the code? I think the Steelers have made a commitment to not letting Lamar Jackson beat them 
and they're going to make the rest of the Ravens to a level that is a bit extreme. The Ravens also have not had good wide receivers. And over the years, the Steelers have had questionable secondaries at times, but they have never lacked front seven um, ability. And so if you can send, like you when you watch the read option, the Steelers are tackling Lamar Jackson whether he has the ball or not. Because they don't care. Like the idea of the read option is, oh, well, the other team has to account for the quarterback. And now we're running against a defense that has one less player because there's a, the Steelers are like, great, we are accounting for the quarterback. We are trying to tackle. We're not accounting for the running back. We will please hand it off. We will deal with whatever. And now I think um, the addition of Derrick Henry is going to change things mm -hmm. there a little bit. Um, and that he's a lot harder to deal with than, you know, J.K. Dobbins was and, you know, Gus Edwards and, and things like that. But uh, uh, the Steelers, I think, are the only team that has ever looked at the zone read and said, I don't care what the running back does, tackle the quarterback. And now you have to be able to stop the run with the rest of your team. And they've done that largely against the Ravens. And then the Ravens receivers haven't been able to make them pay for a whole lot of single coverage. I mean, you remember that game in Pittsburgh last year? I mean, Lamar probably threw three touchdown passes that his receivers. Yeah, I was going to say. It's not like it's a secret as to what the Ravens need to do to defeat the Steelers' plan. It's just that they haven't been able to do it. Yeah, isolated uh, Lamar last year actually I thought played pretty well. He was let down quite a bit. Um, by his re receivers and Mark Andrews, uh, and that yeah, one who had a couple of never drops. Touched the ball. Yeah, um, but yeah, just in terms of Jaden Daniels, you know, yesterday he or he was, came into the game averaging 51 rushing yards. We talked about it on post game. He had five in this one. Second lowest total was against the Ravens with 22. Uh, his 202 passing yards in this game were the second fewest in a game that he started and finished. And then 17 to 34 passing, 50 percent completion percentage is the only time this year he's been below 55 percent in this game. So the Steelers certainly had a formula uh, for this one to be able to slow down Jaden Daniels, and they have in the past with Lamar Jackson. We've seen them in the past be able to do it with Lamar Jackson. Now, we haven't seen him this year. We haven't seen this new Baltimore offense this year, obviously, with Derrick Henry being a part of it. Old friend Deontay Johnson. We'll see if this is finally the week where they can actually work him in to the mix. Um, not Bob Huggins. This is the person's Twitter account, which, by the way, love the name. DM me this. You were saying all these list of people, but not Bob. I was like, no. what did Bob Huggins say? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's skeptical. He's skeptical yeah. about the Steelers' opportunity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh no, but not Bob Huggins DM'd me on Twitter um and said it feels like the Steelers are more talented this year defensively than they have been over the last few years. But do you feel like they are better equipped, even along with that, to play teams within the AFC North, such as the Ravens? Hmm. It's almost two questions because I think the uh, playing the Browns and the Bengals are two uh, is a very different job than playing the Ravens. Um I don't think they're any better equipped to play the Ravens because I think they've been fairly yeah, right. perfectly equipped to play the Ravens. Um, I do think they're better equipped slightly to play the Browns and the Bengals. I really like Dante Jackson addition. Um, I think now with Sutton and Beanie, uh, some of the things we already saw with Cam Sutton in that game really opened my eyes about what's possible uh, in terms of coverage from that regard. Um, I don't know what you even call some of those defenses they were in. Um, I like. I really need to go back and watch the all twenty two to see like what what how I would even characterize what they were doing. Um, it's different, and I think they're in good shape against those passing offenses. I think they've always been in good shape against the Ravens. So yes, I think they're in better shape against the AFC North because I think they'll line up better against the Bengals. They've always been very good against the Ravens and fairly good against the Browns, and the Browns are so bad right now, I don't think it matters. But I, I do think they're, they'll be better against the Bengals this year. Yeah, th that's a good point, too, because I think the Bengals are very different stylistically in terms of the way that they want to spread you out, uh, go empty a ton more, and I'm sure that that's not going to change. Hopefully, you know, well, I say hopefully, hopefully for them. And as a football fan, I think you want everybody at their best. 
I, I like to watch T. Higgins play football personally. So assuming health for him, uh, he hasn't been the healthiest guy over the last couple of seasons, but especially when he's out there, the different things that they can do offensively. So, yeah, I, I feel like they're more athletic on the back end. I think they have more team speed to be able to go sideline to sideline with some of these offenses. Uh, and I think that's probably the biggest difference. I, I, I thought literally just popped in my head now, Alan, as we were talking about this, because you mentioned Dante Jackson. I think about the Sean Elliott, even Patrick Queen, even though he got paid, it was kind of like he at least took it like Baltimore, not wanting to pay him that. Um, talk about Arthur Smith being thrown away in Atlanta, Russell Wilson being thrown away in Denver. They have a lot of guys that I feel like, like Dante Jackson was about to be cut in Carolina, if not traded for. Deshaun Elliott signs here and everybody's like, no, this isn't Justin Simmons. We don't want him. So there's just a lot of guys on this team that I feel like could have that type of chip on their shoulder. Do you do you sense that that's a, a motivating factor at all when talking to these guys or just like the sense surrounding the team? Yes. Yes, I think there is a there's a very healthy thing going on with the Steelers right now where they have a lot of players that have a lot to prove. Some of it is the situation from other teams. Some of it is internal. Like the Steelers themselves gave Najee Harris a lot to prove, right? Yeah, right, yeah. Um, some of it is Cam Hayward, right? He's just... 35, coming yeah. off an injury. He has a lot to prove. Doesn't have anything to do with anything that anybody else did other than himself, mm -hmm. right? And so I just think there are a lot of players on this team that have a lot to prove to a lot of people, and I think they're doing a really nice job of harnessing that energy in a positive way. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, and that just occurred to me because, uh, yeah, especially like such important spots too, right? Like OC quarterback, again, you know, inside linebacker, one of their two starting corners. Like it's interesting, the motivation um, and where you can find it, but that yeah, it's good stuff. Um, you asked me a question before we started recording here that how I felt because coming into the season, we had different teams winning the AFC North, but neither of us predicted that it would be the Steelers to do so. I picked the Ravens to win the AFC North. You picked the Bengals. And I think it's interesting now to look at where we're at. Steelers still leading the pack right now. AFC North this game Sunday going to determine who sits in first place after that. Um, but has your opinion changed on what you feel and would who wins on Sunday change that standpoint if you if it has changed your mind i think i think that's an interesting question not just for me not just for you but also everybody that's out there like being real not just you know uh, it's it's easy to fall into the bias the homerism as a steelers fan i get it but where you legitimately felt like this team was going to be at did you have them winning the division do you think that that changes on sunday i just i think it's a good talking point so i thought it was the Bengals, um mm -hmm. and i have changed my mind i think the steelers are going to win the afc north I, I do. Um, I I think, and part of that is because I already like them against Baltimore. Like, mm -hmm. I, I already thought that I liked the matchup between Steelers and the Ravens. And so the Browns being awful and the Bengals looking less than good, combined with the Steelers starting 7-2, and two, to me, does. Like, right now, it looks like it's going to be the Steelers or the Ravens. And I already like the Steelers against the Ravens head-to-head. -head. And so I think... Yeah, I think I have changed my mind on that. I do think it will be the Steelers to win the AFC North. I still don't think it's going to be with an incredible record. We talked over the bye about our updated season predictions, and I said 10 and 7, which I, I think I'm going to stick with. Um, but I, I do think that right now there is not a team whose situation I would rather be in than the Steelers at this point. Okay, so I picked the Ravens preseason to win the division. I am also changing to the Steelers. I like you, and you put this out there. There's right now one team in the AFC North that can play any type of defense. That team's the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I think another point that we're going to go into, and I don't want to talk too much about it right now, but something that they've proven to me, and I said this yesterday in the postgame show about the offense, was I felt like they were put in a position where it was kind of like a showcase for them. Show us that you can come from behind. Give us confidence that you're able to have one of these games where everything just seems to be going poorly for you, but the offense can kind of dig themselves out of that. And they were able to do that yesterday, and they answered that test. So I feel really good about, like you, how they match up with the Ravens specifically, and I feel like now they can actually score points on them as opposed to in the past just having to rely on the defense carrying the workload and the offense doing just enough. I feel like they can get into some, you know, pseudo shootouts, if you will, with teams and still be able to come out on the winning side if that were to take place. So I feel really good about where they're at. And I also, again, you know, you talk about the back half 
uh, of the schedule here. The Ravens have the Steelers twice, obviously. They still have the Eagles. They still have the Chargers, who could be a really good matchup for them. They have the Texans on Christmas the same day that we play the Chiefs. So I, I, I'm also with the Steelers. I'm a little bit more uh, bullish on the record because I said I got them at 12 wins now. I came in at 10. I got them at 12 and 5 now. Um, but, yeah, as far as would Sunday's result change my mind, I don't think so. I don't think I don't think one loss to the Ravens in that game on Sunday would make me flip my pick. It may it might make me go to eleven wins as opposed to twelve. I think the Steelers would still win the division. Yeah, I I think a win would almost oh. ice it for me. Like I, that that's where I'm at. Um, mm-hmm. A loss would just mean that they probably have to win in Baltimore in the middle of a very difficult stretch for the team in in December. Uh, which sure. is possible, yeah. but yeah. I think it will make it like right now. I feel pretty uh, right now. I feel good about the Steelers, and I mean we're not giving predictions for another three days, but four days. But I am <laughs> yeah. probably going to pick the Steelers to win this week, unless something crazy happens between now and Friday. Uh, and, and if they win this, I feel really good about their chance to win the division. If they lose this, I think it's more of a toss up. Um, and I don't think that we should count the Bengals out either. I think they're. I think they're going to get continue to get better. They Let get me ask you. There. I want to ask you something because, and this is coming from like a Steelers fan perspective. I just I'm curious as to how you would feel if you were sitting in the fan perspective. And this is kind of looking at it now, like we're going backwards in time here. But that Thursday night game, for me, I, I, I saw a lot of people talking about they wanted uh, Cincinnati to win, obviously, to have the Steelers continue to gain ground in the division, or I guess I should say create more of a gap. Um, and obviously, we didn't know Sunday's result at that point yet. So obviously, if they would have beat the Commanders as they did, but also Baltimore lose to Cincinnati, that could have changed the dynamic. But for me, I kind of viewed it already as, okay, the Steelers and Ravens are both going to make the playoffs in terms of which one wins the division, which one gets a wild card. As we sit here right now, I don't know. But I kind of I'm resigned to that fact and I'd rather keep Cincinnati completely out of the picture. Let's keep pushing them away and not even have them be a part of the mix. And I think if they would have won that game against Baltimore, especially with the way Indy's playing right now, especially with the way that I feel like Denver's going to play down like Cincinnati to me if they win that game, I feel like I'm giving them a wild card. Now that they're they're still like a very good offensive team, but I just don't know if the way that their defense is playing with their schedule if they're going to be able to do enough to make the playoffs even with that. So for me I was wanting Baltimore to win that game just to keep pushing Cincinnati out. Well, I think if you're hoping to be rid of the Bengals anytime soon, I've got some bad news. They are one game behind the Denver Broncos for the number seven seed right now. One yeah. game. That's it. <laughs> That's how far they got to go. I would right now. We could see pick, it. I, I think we could see an eight and nine. I would well, still okay. pick right now the four and six Cincinnati Bengals to make the playoffs in the AFC. They are a better team than the Chargers. They are a better team than the Broncos. And they just played the Ravens as close as you can play someone. Um, they're better than the Colts. Like, I, I think the Bengals will be in the playoffs. I do. Um, and so we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But I don't think they're going anywhere. I look at their remaining schedule. And, and I mean, they, these teams all play each other. They still have the Broncos and Chargers on their schedule. Chargers this upcoming week, Sunday Night Football. So, you know, that's obviously going to, to go a long way in determining that. Yeah, I feel like this honestly could be a year where an 8-9 and nine team gets that final wild card. Or we end up with like four teams tied at 9-8. and eight. <laughs> Which, uh, going back to last year, I think you were rooting for from a chaos perspective. You... I wanted like everybody's I, I has really like. Oh, no, you said it about you said it specifically want, about the AFC North. I want I oh, want all four AFC North teams to tie <laughs> one year. I, I hope right. I hope that happens <laughs> once. Um, This was an interesting question. I would kind of want to, you know, pivot from what the exact question was and turn it into a larger talking point here. Because somebody DM me and said, do you think that there's any thought already in terms of Mike Williams' future with the team? Honestly, Mike Williams could have been categorized as somebody I threw into that bucket earlier with guys that had kind of just been tossed away. He probably feels like, you know, he signed with the Jets and was, you know, promised all these things and look how it turned out for him. So probably if you saw his IG caption, very clearly happy. Uh, and he feels like the grass is greener here. But anyways, somebody asked me if I felt like, you know, there was already some thought about Mike Williams' future in Pittsburgh. And I, I mean, we, we, we talked about one game. He had one catch in it. It's, I think it's too early to talk about that. But I think what we could talk about, Alan, is how quickly you find out if a guy 
both the person and the player is the right fit for an organization? Like how quickly in terms of Mike Williams tenure here, <clears throat> excuse me, do you think we'll know if like the Steelers are meant for Mike Williams and Mike Williams is meant for the Steelers? Oh, I think that's tough because I think you can, here's the thing. There's lots of players that are good fits that don't end up sticking around. Like you can mm-hmm. see pretty quickly whether or not it's going to be a fit. Um, but that doesn't mean anything because there's a lot that goes into whether or not a player is going to be back and fit is just a part of it. Fit is sort of a prerequisite, right? Like players that aren't fits do not get brought back, but lots of players that are fits still don't get brought back. Like if Mike Williams goes out here, okay, right now he's got one catch for 34 yards and a touchdown. Mm -hmm. There's, There's what? eight games left. What if he finishes with like 10 of those? Like, okay, then he's going to want a lot of money next year. I mean, are the Steelers going to want to pay $10 million to a 32 year old wide receiver, 31 year old wide receiver. I don't know. Probably not. Um, Let's go the other way. Let's say, I mean, a guy famously hampered by injuries comes out next week and, you know, uh, tears his Achilles done for the year. Like, are the Steelers going to want to invest in a guy, even if he's a really good fit, who's that age, who has been injury prone? Probably not. And so, like, Quan Alexander was a great fit for the Steelers, but he's not yeah. back, right? Because he got hurt, and, and it's not because he wasn't playing well. He was playing really well, but he got hurt, and it just didn't make sense anymore. And so, like, I think there's a lot of variables still to play, but I think you can determine fit pretty quickly, and it, and it, it looks like it. Yeah, I would just I I'm, I thought it's an interesting point just because it, everything's going to go well, obviously, when it goes well, <laughs> like everything went very well for him in his first time here. He made the game winning touchdown catch. He came to a place that obviously, you know, kind of brings out what he does best from an offensive perspective and was really able to own in on that, especially on that one play. Uh, and then, you know, afterwards, it's obviously all excitement in the locker room. And I'm sure just everything has very, been very positive right now there's going to be times where it's not like that and that's where you find out about the guys i feel like more so than anything else so um obviously the early returns there for both mike williams and preston smith have been great uh but we'll see how that plays out mike williams part of this offense uh going forward and that's where we go to our final question where walter we're going with leamy here walter let us know if it's lemmy or leamy we're going with leamy uh for the time being when's the last time we had confidence in the Steelers ability to come back from a deficit this is what I kind of touched on uh last night and a little bit on this episode where it was like it's kind of weird to say but I'm almost glad that they were in a 10 point deficit at one point yesterday just so I could like see that they could do it obviously you want to come out on the winning side of things but I feel like it's important to have those types of battles at some point throughout the regular season to find out about what the team is that you have and now having more confidence in the offense for being able to come out on the other side of that for doing so um where where do you stand on that and you know when do you feel like this is the uh, when was the last time that the Steelers had this type of offense that you feel like could dig themselves out of a hole let me ask you something before i answer okay what were your thoughts in this game as it turns to a 10 point Washington lead early in the third quarter, my social media feed was, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was not in a good place. There were a lot of very upset, very negative, very fatalistic people. Were you, Mm -hmm. were you among them? Did you, were you thinking, well, that's game as Terry McLaurin is running for 54 yards through the Steelers defense. (laughs) Oh, okay. So I didn't know if you meant like big picture, like season wise, I was giving up or just in this game. I'll be honest. I, I think in that game, I was kind of resigned to the fact they weren't going to win it. It just didn't seem like it was the type of game that they, they win. Um, again, I just, I wanted to see it to believe it, that they could dig themselves out of a hole. Like I, I was like, are they built to come back from two possessions down like this? Um, so for this game specifically, especially with everything else that was going wrong for them, yeah, I think in that game I kind of chalked it up as a loss. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's uh, that's the case. I, I I feel like that game played out about the way I thought it was going to. I knew Washington was going to be able to move the ball, so the Steelers could do better job on 
red zone defense uh, where they really struggled in that sure. game. Um, but I mean, some of those turn into field goals, then it's probably mm-hmm. a very different game, but you know, I, I didn't ever feel like the Steelers were out of it. Um, I, I didn't think they were ever, they never pressed. Um, they just kept rolling out, you know, you know everything that, that we do. And, and um, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a, I thought it was a really, it was not an unexpected offensive performance for me. It was good, but I, I, I thought that was the case. Well, so here's what I said on the post game, and I'll you know kind of restate it on here for anybody that didn't watch or listen to that. Was to me, this was the the most impressive thing about this entire game from this offense to me, and from Arthur Smith was just their their willingness to stick true to themselves. Uh, you know, they go down by ten, but they're still they the next drive they're running the ball. You know, they're staying true to their identity, uh, and then they score a touchdown and answer right back. I think so. The belief in me came back immediately within one possession just because they drove right down the field. They got seven and they were back into it. Um, I saw a lot of people talking about like the defense though in this one. And and I'll be honest, like obviously you don't want to allow that double dip right before halftime. And then right after halftime where your offense doesn't see the ball while allowing two touchdowns. Um, but just overall like execution, the way that they looked. And again, we already talked about the way that they limited Jaden Daniels. I have very few qualms about the way that the defense played. I still feel like it's a really good defensive unit. Um, we kind of touched on this on post game, but I just wanted to get your thoughts just because over the last you know 24 hours, really, since we did that, I feel like I've seen a lot more people again, concerned about the defense. Hmm. I'm they're the second best defense in the league. Yeah. I, again, I think a lot of it is, has to do, and, and one of those touchdowns they allowed was, by the way, in a short field because of the punt, you know, the fake punt execution. But also, like, again, I think most of it is related to the the touchdown right before half, touchdown right after half. They allowed their first points that they have all year in the third quarter in this one, but then they pitch a shutout in the fourth. So, like, you know, yeah, still I, a really good know, team. It's a really good defense. I Sometimes really good defenses give up 27 points. That's only... By the way, the NFL average is like twenty-two. So, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like that's that's not that's there's nothing bad about this defense. It's really good. I, I don't have any any concerns about the Steelers defense. Yeah, I don't either. I was just I was curious to get your take on that real quick uh, before we get out of here, just because, like I said, I think a lot of people, uh, for whatever reason, in the last twenty-four hours, that's come to the forefront. Uh, anything else to add, Alan? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Well. Other than that, tell the people where they can find you. At Saunders underscore PGH on X, Instagram, and TikTok. PGH Steelers Now, sites account SteelersNow.com. Sign up for uh, SM Plus. Use promo code Allen10. Get 10% off an annual subscription. Ad free. Ad free. Mm-hmm. Every time you're cool. on your phone and you click on SteelersNow.com and you really just want to know whether Nick Herbert's going to play this week or not, you're going to scroll through seven pages of ads, cursing the whole time, accidentally buying a blender. Just sign up for SM Plus instead. We always talk about uh, wanting people to tell us what they want in terms of additions to the content. Alan, we made an addition at the site. I feel like we should bring up and we give a shout out did. to here. Aaron Becker, formerly of Yard Barker, has joined Steelers Now team. He's going to be working with me on the south side uh, during the week and uh, during games, home games anyway. So, um, not a one-to-one replacement for what we had Nick Farabaugh doing, but I think uh, spiritually very similar in terms of what you guys can expect to see. Probably we'll see Aaron here on the YouTube channel. Definitely we'll see Aaron here on the YouTube channel very soon. I'll just keep teasing that for now. Uh, but definitely we'll be seeing Aaron here on the YouTube channel in his own role and then also just around as we generally uh, have our peeps be around. Very excited. Aaron and I have followed each other for a while, so I'm very glad that he's joining the team. Uh, once again, I had to post the the Dream Team meme uh, on Twitter because of the addition. So very excited. Shout out to Aaron. Welcome aboard. Uh, be sure to go show him love on his account as well. You can find him, Aaron Becker. Uh, follow me everywhere, Zachary Smith PGH. If you're listening somewhere else, by the way, be sure to leave us a five-star review and subscribe over there. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from. Just search Steelers Afternoon Drive. Search that on TikTok as well. You'll find us over there. For Alan Saunders and myself, thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive. Mm-hmm.